Hello, welcome to OS from the BBC World Service. I'm Nuala McGovern. Good to have you with us. Uh, For much of this edition of OS, we're going to talk about how the US response to COVID-19 might change under the incoming Biden administration. We're going to do that with two of the people who will shape it. Uh, We do already know that the United States is the country with the most recorded cases, also the most deaths from coronavirus. And one of the first things uh, Joe Biden, president-elect, did uh, when he was uh, confirmed was to appoint a COVID-19 task force. At the time, he warned the country faced, and I quote, a very dark winter. Now, two of the people on the 12 strong task force agreed to spend time answering my questions and yours and the handover of power that will happen on January 20th that's inauguration day and that's when the work of my guests will begin in earnest so we have Miss Lois Pace executive director and president of the Global Health Council and she works on awareness and action on health issues around the world also Dr Eric Goosby who's an expert on infectious diseases he's a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. And we spoke yesterday. And the first question came from one of our regular American listeners. This is Mike Brodigam. I'm an American, but I'm currently in Tallinn, Estonia. The thinking seems to be if everyone in America wears a mask for Biden's first hundred days, the virus will disappear and we can declare victory. I'm not so sure. And my question is, what does it mean to wear a mask? And can you really expect people to comply with these directives? For example, what kind of a mask? How often does it have to be cleaned? How often does it have to be replaced? Miss Pace, what about that? I mean, it is the most controversial part of this whole pandemic, I think, has been the mask wearing. If you'd like to answer some of Mike's questions, and then I'd be curious why that was decided to be the first part, I suppose, released of Mr. Biden's plan. Yeah, no, I appreciate, Mike, for this question, too. We know masks have been controversial in a way that those of us in public health truly wish they they hadn't been. Um, And yet here we are. I think uh, President-elect Biden took this stance and made this commitment because he wanted to maybe uh, reset our baseline and kind of start anew and challenge the American people to um, maybe put politics aside as much as possible and truly focus on on public health and those principles. I think Mike's right to ask additional questions and the onus will be on us and on others on President-elect Biden's team to really communicate why masks remain important. Uh, I don't think anyone is suggesting, or we should rather clarify that no one's suggesting that suddenly the the virus will disappear as a result of people wearing masks for three months. That's certainly Uh, not our understanding. I think the main point, though, was to help people know the role that each of us plays in fighting this virus, um, that we still have a ways to go, even though help is on the way. And also, there's a holistic approach that's required, right? And so there's a lot of talk of vaccines. And I know that some of our concern is around people kind of doing away with principles like mask wearing, like avoiding indoor gatherings and saying, okay, well, we'll just all get a shot and everything will be fine. And we all know that that won't be true in the near term. We still very much have to keep up the other parts of this package or tools in our toolbox. And Dr. Eric, do you think you will go to the point uh, that Mike brought up of like, what sort of mask is the correct one? How often does it have to be cleaned? You know, I met a guy in in Reno, Nevada that had been wearing the same mask, like, you know, the blue surgical masks for two months. Yeah. I think the fact of the matter is, is that when COVID first came out, we weren't sure what the primary mode of transmission was. If it was like the influenza virus, it would be surface contact spread predominantly and droplet, but for flu. But for COVID, it was droplet with less transmission occurring by contact spread. So the initial recommendations were following the other COVID virus on the planet out there and its pattern of behavior, natural history. But this virus was tricky and had a different mode to move from one individual to another. Masks are extremely effective in studies one after the other, from early on in Wuhan to uh, Singapore to Italy and then later in Spain, you see use of masks in small populations and small studies uh, that appear to approach 95% effective in blunting transmission. That's been repeated a few times now. So I think the message, as Lois has said, is wear the mask 
and we need to think about the issues of frequent changing, et cetera. I would say that the Center for Disease Control has many recommendations that are accurate and science-based that speak to reuse, type of mask, uh, fitting considerations, all of that. Uh Well, thank you for that. And I hear you and you've outlined a, a lot of best practices, I suppose, there as well. And you could have the best will in the world. But some of the questions we received point to the difficulties that you are going to be facing. I want to bring in two more contributors. Uh, let's listen to them. We'll listen to them back to back. I am Dr. Joseph Varon. I'm the chief medical officer at United Memorial Medical Center in Houston. What kind of educational programs are you going to have in order to ascertain that the public is aware of the severity of COVID as well as the measures that need to be taken in order to flatten the curve, including social distancing, using a mask, and the importance of avoiding uh, large crowds. It seems that the current administration doesn't have too much of public information and it's the media the one that has been sharing the the world hi my name is barbara hunsicker and i live in huntsville alabama my grandfather died of covid 19 on august 6th my question for you is over the course of this pandemic it has become clear that not only are we battling the coronavirus itself but also the virus of disinformation What steps does your task force plan to take to counteract all too common beliefs such as masks aren't necessary, hospitals exaggerate the number of COVID deaths, or the vaccines being developed aren't safe and might even include a government spyware chip? Okay, I've come across a lot of people that have expressed hesitancy with the vaccine, for example, or skeptical of the severity of COVID. What are you going to do about it, Ms. Pace? Yeah, I first off, um, I just have to offer my condolences to Barbara for losing her grandfather and, and others who have lost people in this fight. With regards to how we get over this hump, I, I do think that, unfortunately, um, given where we are at the rates in this country, you know, 200,000 cases a day, which is, you know, something we'd projected a few weeks ago, and, and with the number of deaths on the heels of that and also accelerating um, at 2,000 a day uh, or more, we will each knows someone who knows someone with COVID. I think it's going to be harder to deny the reality of the disease. And I think that that will help our cause in some ways because I feel that we will be able to identify more messengers with direct experience who are able and willing to speak out about that reality. And so as heartbreaking as it has been to have so many people affected, I'm grateful to people who have been affected um, for their willingness to speak out and talk to their neighbors, talk to their families and friends. We know in public health that it's not just about the message, but the messengers. And so in response to both questions, the board is working with the transition staff and team to understand the type of influencers and ambassadors we need to employ and deploy next year and beyond so that people truly understand the gravity of the situation and the power that they have. Um, what we know, what we don't, how that might evolve. We really are in a position where we need to rebuild trust in this country, we know. And so we're taking this part of our role very seriously, particularly when it comes to marginalized populations, um, like people who live in rural communities, Black, Brown, and Indigenous peoples, and others who are greatly affected by the rates that we see. And I want to get to that in in just a moment. But let me turn to you, Dr. Eric. So, for example, when I'm speaking to you just over the past few hours, I uh, read this in some of the New York papers, uh, and this is relating to New York. The Uniformed Firefighters Association, they did their own survey of 2,000 members of the New York City Fire Department, the FDNY, showed that 55% of participants said they would not bother getting vaccinated. I mean... These were people who were first responders uh, in in many instances. I mean, their city, what it went through. How are you going to combat that mindset? We understand the knowledge deficit, the misinformation, uh, the conviction that people have to believing falsehoods persists. And I think we see the behavior that goes along with that. 
telling the truth is the core shift that needs to occur. The information is available, but it needs to be, as I think Dr. Joseph alluded to, coming from the right spoke persons, identifying, as Lois said, ambassadors that are credible to communities that have reason to distrust uh, authorities coming and saying that this is the way things are. We need to identify those natural leaders in communities that are already credible and uh, work with them to move them to trusting and believing that the extraordinary morbidity and mortality that we're seeing now uh, is real and will continue to expand. But are you convinced, just in a very small sample, that 55%, it's just one city in one state, do you think you could turn their minds around with this plan that you have to try and tell the truth, as you say, or have these ambassadors? I do. I, I just came out of the hospital late last night with uh, in the emergency room. First responders were all over the area. They are the people who are often finding people at home. It is these individuals who are bringing people into the emergency room or talking to us from the site. I don't have any doubt that those individuals are seeing the direct results of the virus and I believe will come uh, forward. Thank you for that, Doctor. Let me bring another question that we received. I'm Delia Walker-Huntington in Miramar, Florida. There is some amount of distrust among communities of color against taking vaccines based on America's history. What will the Biden-Harris administration do to garner support for the vaccine in these marginalized communities? And how will the team ensure that the most vulnerable will indeed have access to the vaccine? Yeah, this is something that's... Um near and dear to me and probably Eric as well. So um, the plans are still under very much underway and it's going to involve these messengers that we were just talking about, right? Um, But I think backing up, I wanna pick up where Eric left off in terms of education and how we are truly communicating um, to these communities, particularly communities of color, how we even got here. I think there, first off, is a really important message that we've heard from Dr. Fauci, um, but that we need to amplify about even just how this vaccine came to be developed um, and how it came to be developed so quickly. I think you have WHO um, with strong messages around this as well. And this is important because, you know, there is a rightful question about whether things were rushed. I think what we want to communicate is how this is so unprecedented because the world and all of these stakeholders, um, the private sector, governments and the like, have been able to come together and rally around this one cause. And that's what assisted the acceleration of these innovations. There are still very clear parameters and regulations in place, particularly um, through the FDA and all of the career staff there who are ensuring this is not um, sort of getting ahead of itself, but ensuring that there is still safety um, and, and a level of effectiveness that warrants us bringing these vaccines to market. Now, what this means for black people in this country in particular is the right question, right? I know that there was very intentionally Um, a requirement that there was heavy recruitment for certain populations like black and brown people, um, but also older at-risk groups, um, so that there could be a greater assuredness of both the researchers and reviewers, but also of the general public that these vaccines and the studies around them uh, have been rooted in or inclusive of these communities so that they're not sort of receiving them for the very first time. We know that black people are dying at at least twice the rate of whites in this country when it comes to COVID-19, let alone the hospitalization rates among black, brown, and indigenous groups. And so there's a reason why why we want people to take this vaccine, right? We know and believe strongly that the vaccine will, will yield a greater degree of protection, particularly for these groups. Thanks so much to my guests. We're actually going to play more of that conversation with Ms. Pace and Dr. Gooseby a little bit later on the programme including getting to vaccines for first responders, also how long might it take for the U.S. population to reach herd immunity, and whether the U.S. will join the COVAX program, so that is uh, to ensure equal access uh, for poorer countries uh, to get vaccines to their people. (music) 
This is OS on the BBC. I'm Nuala McGovern and we are live from London. Let's take a look now at some of the other stories briefly that are being worked on across BBC newsrooms. China's Supreme Court has hired Uganda's former Chief Justice Bart Katuribi as a member of its expert committee on adjudication of international commercial disputes. Justice Katuribi will sit on the committee for the next four years. He retired from Uganda's Supreme Court in June after reaching the mandatory retirement age of 70. A retired teacher from South Africa who rose to fame this year after releasing her first song has died from COVID-19. Alpha Sel Lerper, who was 65, commonly known as G65, was isolating at home after testing positive on Monday. Her song, Obani Lababantu, topped streaming and download charts in early November. And the developer of the new video game, Cyberpunk 2077, is adding warnings to the game after reviewers and charities complained it caused epileptic seizures. It thanked one reviewer who said it had triggered one major seizure and left them close to another several times. The game released on Thursday after, was, was released I should say, on Thursday after months of repeated delays. Now, let us continue with OS from uh, the BBC. The time, 16.22 in London. I want to bring in one of our regular health experts, Dr Maria Sundram, infectious diseases epidemiologist at ICES, Ontario, in Toronto. Good to have you with us, doctor. Uh, You're hearing a little bit there. I find it pretty fascinating. It's like we're looking into the future with Dr Eric Goosby (laughs) and also Ms Lois Pace. What did you think? Oh, I, I think, you know, what they said is so prescient and so relevant. And I, I'm really glad that they're focusing on and thinking about underserved communities, because I, I think that's where this uh, pandemic has hit the hardest. Yes, and uh, very much, uh, particularly Miss Pace, I think, has been thinking very deeply uh, about mm-hmm. that. Um Also, because I suppose when it comes to vaccine hesitancy, it can be coming from so many different places. Um, It could have been a community that was marginalised previously, or it could come from, I don't know, misinformation or disinformation on the internet. But I was really um, struck when I was reading through your Twitter feed uh, yesterday, (laughs) because you have... I suppose we could say a plan or a system in place for how to talk to people who may be um, reluctant to get the vaccine. What have you learned, do you think? So this has sort of been my experience from the last sort of nine or 10 years working in influenza vaccine um, and working with some really incredible mentors who research, um, you know, have spent their careers researching uh, people who are hesitant to get vaccines and, and the reasons why they're hesitant. So my personal experiences and also the existing research kind of suggests that it's best to start from this place of empathy and kindness to acknowledge the reasons why people might be hesitant or might be confused or why, might want to know more. Um, you know, to a certain extent, that's the reason that we became researchers. That's all we do is ask and answer questions. So I think it's really important to sort of establish that common ground and sort of validate people's questions if they're coming to you for advice um, rather than saying, well, you're wrong. Um, or, or dismissing that. I think it's really important to, to try to have that conversation with, uh, with empathy. You know, what we're just seeing over the past couple of minutes is that Canada has approved the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. What do you think about that? Oh, it's super exciting. I'm really happy to see that. And I'm really glad that Health Canada um, has had the time to review that application uh, very carefully. And I'm really glad uh, with, their, with their result. Is there in Canada, like there has been in the United States, that deeply politicized discussion <laughs> about whether to take the vaccine or whether to wear a mask? I, in my experience, I don't think it's quite as divided along political lines. I do think there is um, certainly some vaccine hesitancy in Canada, just as there is in the US. Um, and I think it's really important to sort of investigate all of the different reasons why that might be the case. Um, some people might feel a little hesitant based on the fact that uh, the the vaccine was produced quite quickly uh, compared to some of the other vaccines that we, we have. Some folks might not understand fully what's in the vaccine and they may have questions about safety and uh, effectiveness. And those are questions that we're prepared to answer. Um, 
Well, I want to actually just turn to one aspect that maybe our listeners were hearing in the bulletin as well, uh, that people with a history of significant allergic reactions should not have Mm -hmm. uh, the Pfizer uh, jab. This is according to regulators. After two NHS, this National Health Service in the UK, workers there had allergic reactions on Tuesday. They're fine now, is my understanding. Um, What should people take away from that? Um, I think this is another really good example of safety mechanisms and surveillance mechanisms working exactly the way that they're supposed to. So um, in both cases, these people um, who had the allergic reactions had a history of those kind of severe allergic reactions. And some of the listeners may also have that history. Um, Perhaps if you eat nuts, um, your throat may get itchy or your face may swell up, that kind of thing. Um, The reason that we were looking at Um, those outcomes is because in the vaccine uh, safety report, oh, sorry, I guess (laughs) we've got a timer going. That's okay. In the the vaccine safety (laughs) report. Eggs are ready. (laughs) Right, exactly. Um, 0.6% of the vaccine recipients and 0.5% of the of the placebo recipients um, have this uh, potential type of reaction. It's not clear whether it is related to the vaccine. So um, what's really wonderful is that uh, even though we don't see clear evidence that this is related to the vaccine, we're still looking out for it. And we were able to identify these cases in a lightning fast way and then issue this guidance um, out of kind of an abundance of caution, just in case there is a potential link. But the existing science kind of suggests that there isn't, um, but we're just kind of being as careful as possible here. So this is a really great example of safety mechanisms and, um, you know, our reporting mechanisms being lightning fast and super agile, exactly the way that we want them to work. I'm just going to turn back for people who are just tuning in that Health Canada has approved the COVID-19 vaccine uh, from Pfizer and BioNTech. Uh, so clearing the way for shots to be delivered and administered across the country. Uh, this is the nation's first coronavirus vaccine green light from a new interim order that allowed accelerated uh, approval. Um, we've just got uh, about 30 or 40 seconds, uh, Dr. Maria. But do they have a plan for who will get the first jab? Do, we, do, do you know that yet? Yes, yeah, so it'll be um, it'll be a little bit up to different provinces. Um, mm-hmm. For for your listeners who are not familiar with that term, provinces are similar to states or other sort of geographic uh, divisions um, that are quite large. Um, but in general, the folks who are um, going to be able to get the vaccine first are those who are at higher risk, and that includes healthcare workers and especially people working in long-term care facilities with older adults and then the older adults themselves. So very similar to what's happening in the UK and what will eventually happen in the US as well. Dr. Maria Sandram, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us on OS from the BBC. With bbc.com slash news, you get the latest news stories anytime you like. bbc.com slash news offers you the most comprehensive news coverage in the world, and its stories are easy to search and navigate. Whether you're interested in science, health, technology or business, the bbc.com slash news website can offer it all. It also gives you the opportunity to listen live to our news output or check the latest breaking news with our minute-by-minute news feed. If you want to take the news with you, we offer you downloadable podcasts to listen at your convenience, or archive programming so you can catch up on the programmes you've missed. Or you can access bbc.com slash news on your mobile phone. bbc.com slash news also lets you give feedback direct to our programme teams. All this content, coverage and opportunity makes the BBC the world leader in news coverage online. bbc.com slash news. Hello and welcome to OS from the BBC World Service. I'm Nuala McGovern. This hour you're hearing a conversation with two people that will be helping shape the policy responses to COVID-19 in the States. Dr Eric Goosby and Miss Lois Pace are two members of President-elect Joe Biden's Coronavirus Task Force team and they took time to answer questions sent to us from the US and explain their plans to curb the spread of the virus in a deeply divided United States. BBC News with Debbie Russ. 
The French cabinet has endorsed a draft law which aims to combat radical Islam after a spate of attacks blamed on religious extremists. The legislation tightens rules on homeschooling and online hate speech and demands religious neutrality for public service officials. It now goes to Parliament for approval. Members of Joe Biden's coronavirus task force have told the BBC they expect that it will take at least a year for the United States to achieve herd immunity to COVID-19. They say this would result from a combination of a mass vaccination programme and growing levels of immunity in the population. Britain's medicines regulator has said that people with a history of significant allergic reactions should not have the new Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine. Its advice comes after two people suffered an allergic reaction. Both are understood to be fine today. The vaccine has now been approved for use in Canada. Police in Ghana say five people have been killed in violence linked to Monday's presidential and parliamentary elections. The results are expected later today. The president of Iran, Hassan Rouhani, has said that his country is ready to return to full compliance with the terms of the international nuclear accord as soon as its partners do so. President Donald Trump pulled out of the deal in 2018 and reimposed crippling sanctions on Tehran. Farmers leaders in India have rejected government proposals that would modify controversial agricultural reforms. Tens of thousands of farmers camping out on roads leading to the capital just want the new laws repealed. And scientists say the weight of all human-made objects on Earth will probably exceed that of living things for the first time this year. The weight of all living things, known as biomass, has been falling, mainly due to the loss of forests. And that's the latest BBC News. Hello, welcome to OS from the BBC World Service. If you're just tuning in, I'm Nuala McGovern. And on OS, we always want to bring you the stories that you are discussing and are sharing. Uh, and one that a lot of people are talking about today is this accusation of an alleged racist term used in the Champions League game last night. Now, that match is actually going to restart uh, this evening, uh, not, not, too, not too many hours from now. Uh, we're going to bring you what we know this half hour. We're also going to hear reaction from people around the world. So do stay with us for that. Um, But I want to return to a conversation we were having earlier, if you were with us. Um, If not, you can always listen online later. Uh, But let us turn to our conversation with two people that are on US President-elect Joe Biden's task force. So this is on COVID-19. Appointing this team, that was one of the very first things that Mr. Biden did uh, when his election victory was confirmed. Maybe meaning it as a sign of intent that his administration would do things differently. And we have been spending a good amount of time with two of the 12 members of that task force. And they answered questions um, from me, but also from listeners and contributors. Thanks so much to those of you who sent questions in. Um, The members are Miss Lois Pace. She is Executive Director and President of the Global Health Council, uh, working on awareness and action on health issues all around the world. And Dr. Eric Goosby, who is an expert on infectious diseases and he's a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. A little earlier, they were talking about masks, education, vaccine hesitancy, uh, particularly among people of colour. Let's pick up the conversation uh, with someone you may have heard on OS before. Hello, my name is Anthony Almagera. I'm calling from Brooklyn, New York, where I live and I'm also a paramedic lieutenant for the fire department here in New York City. Unfortunately, Five of my fellow co-workers have passed away from getting coronavirus while working. And I also have numerous others that are still out sick long term from getting sick with the virus. How will the federal government coordinate with state and city local governments to ensure that all first responders will have access to not only the vaccine, but the secondary booster shot that is needed as well? From the reports I've been reading, I see that there may not be enough. Thanks, Anthony, for that. This is an issue, and I'm wondering how closely you've been working with Vice President Mike Pence and his task force in these days. Will there be uh, enough vaccine to cover the United States, which is 330 million times two, uh, if they have to get a second dose, depending on what vaccine is employed? Yes, I think that uh, Anthony's statement is disturbing, but I think real. 
Uh, the reality is that there are only so many vaccines that have been developed in a given time frame, and that the four vaccines that are in queue all have similar efficacy numbers and safety numbers. And I feel that that all tells us that at the end of the development of the vaccines, the numbers are in the realm that we will be able to cover the people who are at highest risk in a timely fashion and move over the three to four months to the general population who afford no special risk. That consideration is a difficult calculation, but it's even harder to implement. And the implementation all occurs at the local level. Our goal is to be clear about the expectation, the prioritization of risk, who should get vaccinated first. And then with the uh, knowledge that there are exceptions, that people cross groups, that someone older with comorbidities may move up or down a priority list, and we need to be open and aware of that. But we need to be one voice once we've decided how to move this agenda. And I think we are in the middle of putting that prioritized list together. Uh, so it you is, do. Um, sorry for interrupting so, you, doctor. Um, so you okay. do not know yet exactly who would be first in line. Well, uh, I think every advisory group is now coming forward with uh, recommendations from the ACIP, the Center for Disease Control, as well as states like California, Oregon, Washington, and Nevada, same with New York, have set up their own review committees to look at the scientific validity of the vaccines as these data are made available. I'm confident that we will be able to review and get the vaccines out that are safe and effective. And my belief in looking at the data in a preliminary way already for three of them, it tells me that these vaccines are effective and we will have enough to get to that goal of herd immunity. So how we do that will be over the course of a year, but we will begin to see the effects once 30 to 40 percent of the population begins to show evidence of immunity. We're now somewhere between 15 and some expect it could be double that. So 15 to 30 percent are positive now. We need to reach 70 percent to achieve herd immunity. But the combination of individuals who are infected from the virus itself matched with the vaccination groups, we will be able to get there toward the end of the year, beginning of the following year. So and I'm when you say, yeah. sorry, doctor, but when you say the okay. end of the year, are you talking about 2021? Yes, at the end of the year for 2021. So you feel there could be herd immunity in the United States by the end of 2021? By the end of 2021. That is certainly our goal. And the modeling shows that that's the range that we're talking about. Thank you for that. So let me turn to a couple of other aspects when it comes to the vaccine. Just uh, before I started speaking to you, coming through on our wires is that Pfizer's vaccine offers strong protection after the first dose. This news from the United States that the Food and Drug Administration, their first analysis of the clinical trial data, also found that the coronavirus vaccine worked well, regardless of a volunteer's race, weight Mm. or age. Mm. Is this a game changer, Ms. Pace? Well, I mean, I think that we've all been waiting anxiously for for uh, additional review and, and, and FDA's sort of conclusion um, in this regard. And it's nice to see this data rolling out. That is, that's that's positive. I think the data around age particularly is heartening because we want to be sure that there, you know, there isn't a disparity um, with regards to people who we know are at greater risk, particularly those uh, at at advanced ages, um, let alone um, the race disparity, I mean, and, 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 and others with regards to comorbidities and the like. We, we want this vaccine to be just as effective across populations, particularly at-risk populations. And that means people living with chronic conditions and, uh, and the like. And so it's a step in the right direction. Yes. I, I mean, I think our listeners would really want to know when, 
will a vaccine uh, be approved and when might the first jab take place? Uh, we've had in the UK, Margaret Keenan, 90 years of age, who's had the first uh, Pfizer vaccine uh, jab and uh, said she found it a privilege to be so. What do you think the timeline is for the United States? Well, I, I know that we are just on the verge of making that decision uh, this week and next week. That's what we're doing. So I think that uh, we were thrilled to see the UK move ahead with open season on vaccinating. And it's truly a remarkable moment. And we are right behind you and just as eager to do it. I wanted to emphasize that the Pfizer vaccine, as all of the vaccines from Moderna, from Janssen vaccine, the Ebola technology that was used for the mRNA activity with the vac vaccination strategies there, are following the traditional phase one, phase two, phase three, approvement of a new agent, vaccine, drug, whatever. Uh, and in addition, all of that has been normal with normal numbers, the normal expected evaluations, et cetera. And none of it has been rushed or corners cut, which would raise our sense of insecurity around the results. In addition to that, the FDA once the vaccine is approved, is not going to follow it for a few months, which is the traditional post-study follow-up. They're going to follow this for a year out with different groups stratified by age and race just to see if there are any differences that have occurred. We have, by the way, never seen any differences in vaccinations between races. So it's not something we would expect. But because of the concern in the community, we are monitoring it closely. I understand. I think it's very important for people to know that. So thank you, Doctor. Would either of you have an estimate of when you might have that first? And I found it incredibly moving, I have to say, when Mrs. Keenan uh, was getting her vaccination. Uh, yeah. When that picture might come from the States? Is it a matter of a week, two weeks, a month? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, Lars, you want to take it? I mean, I, yeah, I think that, that's, that's the hard in question. You remember that the, you know, he's still president elect Biden, right? And so a lot of that is, um, re you know, relying on the current administration and the plans that they have in place. You know, hopefully it is, um, you know, before January 20th or 21st. Uh, um, but yeah, I don't think that we, I think we're asking the same questions. And I don't know if we have um, the best sense of when that will happen, but I think we're hopeful that it will roll out as estimated or planned or promised this year. How helpful uh, and how transparent has the Trump administration task force headed by Vice President Mike Pence been offering information, how much vaccine might be available, what the shortages might be, what the challenges might be? Yeah, I mean, I think it's good. The good news is that um, these um, transition teams, we call them here, have been able to get in the door um, at various agencies and really walk through um, through our through the plans at say with staff at you know health agencies like CDC, FDA, and the like. Um, that just happened this month, as you know, or late last month, and so. It's still sort of underway. I think I think those staff and those teams are working around the clock to continue unpacking what we know and what we don't. But, I, you know, the, the door has been opened and, you know, there are, you know, designated people who do have a seat at the table in some regards. And so I think that's that's a positive development. So we'll just continue to learn as much as possible so that we can get the president elect ready on day one. I understand. I want to turn to another issue. Um, there are, of course, policies of uh, Donald Trump, which will be different <laughs> under a Biden policy. Uh, the WHO, I know, Ms. Pace, you had written a letter talking uh, about the WHO and about the fact its membership, the US membership, uh, was important, particularly during a global pandemic. I think you okay. put it like suspending funding to the WHO would be like cutting the water supply to a firefighter in the middle of a fire. Well, it looks like that instead will continue under Joe Biden. But I want to talk about COVAX. Now, this is the program which it's global collaboration uh, to accelerate uh, the development the production and the access uh, to COVID-19 tests and vaccines uh, so importantly as well will the US join COVAX under President-elect Biden well I think that uh, looking at a world that is struggling with COVID as a pandemic 
Uh, we do not have one country that is taking the brunt of it. We have a pandemic and every country, everyone in the world needs to be engaged in responding. In that light, the vaccination needs to uh, move to the planet, not just to the rich countries. And everybody is very concerned that, as we have seen with every other vaccine that has been developed, it goes to those who can pay for it first and sometimes only. I understand. Mm, yeah. Just very briefly, doctor, um, would you advise President-elect Joe Biden to join COVAX? I think that there are no other motors that will look at the requirements needed to put vaccine in the hands and the bodies of people who are not going to be able to pay for it. This is something we need to look at to be part of and understand if there are concerns with it, we need to be aware of those as well. But this is a decision that hasn't been made, but I would encourage uh, President-elect Biden to engage in understanding the utility of this partnership. I, I would, uh, I, I would, I would definitely in, encourage our engagement, as Erica said. Um, and I, and I think an important point here is that um, it's not only about um, ensuring there's equitable distribution of vaccine um, to countries who can't necessarily afford it. That's certainly a critically important role for Covax, but. There's also uh, something in it for us as well, especially when we come back to the question, I think it was from Anthony, about um, vaccine supply. And, and this is about the world coming together um, to help each other. And as you know, Nula, I'm very supportive of international cooperation in this regard because we've seen it work. We saw it work with um, delivering supplies to other countries um, for COVID-19. We've seen it um, with regards to technologies. And we'd like to see it play out with vaccines and, and the U.S. not being a part of that collective, not only is detrimental to others around the world, but also to our own citizens, potentially. I want to thank both of you so much. I hope you'll come back on as you get your feet under the table. You're probably too busy to come and chat to a radio show. But if you get a few minutes here and there, we'd love to have both of you back on. I love Radio Nula and I, and, and I appreciate the BBC and the reporting you're doing. So thanks to you and all your listeners for having us. Yeah, me too. It's, it's a real pleasure. And you really asked excellent questions. So thank you for that. Dr. Eric Goosby, who is an expert on infectious diseases, professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, but now a member of the Coronavirus Task Force at the White House, or should I say from January 20th, along with Miss Lois Pace, who's executive director and president of the Global Health Council and working on awareness and action on health issues around the world. Fascinating stuff. Thanks to them.